All right, so we're going to start, we're going to spend most of the day talking about how we can um, generate alcohol, synthesize alcohol, it's various ways we can do that. Um, so we're going to start by reviewing the reactions that we have at this point to, to generate alcohols, um, which are predominantly uh, addition reactions. You could also throw substitution on there as well. If we had a, a good leaving group, we could have a substitution reaction happening with, um, with an OH group. If we had sodium hydroxide as our nucleophile, um, but the the more controlled way we have of of um, generating these alcohols are the addition reactions from an alkene. Um, so we have just the acid catalyzed hydration. We have the oxymercuration, demercuration, and then we have the hydroboration, which is our anti-Markovnikov reaction. All right, so all of those we're pretty comfortable with at this point. I'll review um, from C radicals was 10, so from chapter eight. Um, but we just want to remember that they're still there. Um, we're also going to start talking about oxidation state a little bit. Oops. Um, let me reformat this just a little bit. Um, so at this point, we've been looking at formal charge um, to, to decide how many, what the charge is on an atom um, in an organic compound. And that's, that's usually the, the most effective way to do it, um, where you're basically just counting how many bonds and lone pairs something has. Um, so a carbon with four bonds is always going to have a charge of zero because it's got a total of, of four owned electrons. Um, and that's going to be compared to the number of electrons it has on the periodic table. So a nitrogen has um, that has three bonds will also have a charge of zero. Um, and this is always going to be assumed that everything has a full valence. But it, the other thing that's that's problematic about it is that um, it's it treats all covalent bonds equally. Um, so if we want to get a little bit more specific um, than just just you know having a sheer sheer number of electrons around, if we want to get a little bit more precise. Um, we start using oxidation state. And so oxidation state is, we're not going to actually be talking about the charge on an atom. We're, when we talk about oxidation state, we're going to be talking about how much sort of access does each atom have to the electrons around it. So in this case, we basically are going to treat every bond as though it was ionic. And every covalent bond, we're going to treat it as though um, it whatever's more electronegative controls all of those electrons. So we're going to treat it like it's they're not being shared. So this is not representative of how reality works, but it's a useful way of, of estimating how stable certain compounds are. Generally speaking, on, on Earth, things are because we have so much oxygen around. Um, things are most stable when they're in their more, most oxidized state. Um, so charge is a good overall picture of how stable a molecule is, but oxidation state can get a little bit more specific, and we can use that to, um, to evaluate and kind of figure out what the reaction is going to produce um, when we put it, when we put a organic compound um, in, in conjunction with a reducing agent or an oxidizing agent. So again, this is not the same as saying that an atom has a charge. Formal charge is still our way of doing that. Oxidation state is sort of a separate tool, even though it's still it's talking about the charge. It's not talking about the actual charge. It's just a, a useful tool. 
Um, so if we look at the same compound, so in terms of formal charge, this methanol here, everything has a full valence. And if we count the electrons, everything's got the right number of bonds. So everything has a charge of zero. If we look at the oxidation state of the same molecule, we're going to treat all of the carbon hydrogen bonds as though carbon really owns those electrons. And we're going to treat the carbon oxygen bond as though oxygen owns those electrons. And so in, if we look at the oxidation state of methanol, carbon has six electrons. And so we would say that the oxidation state of methanol here is going to be for carbon is negative two. Right, it's oxidation state is negative two because it has control of six electrons. Um, and on the periodic table, it has four electrons. Right, what's what would the oxidation state of the oxygen be? You say that again, Cody? I'm gonna guess zero. It would be so oxygen's more electronegative than everything else in here, right? So of the eight electrons that are around the oxygen, it controls all of them. So it has eight electrons. And on the periodic table, oxygen has six, correct? So oxygen's also going to have a oxidation state of negative two. And that's going to be the most common thing we see for oxygen. Oxygen, unless there's fluorine or a peroxide bond, um, we're usually going to see oxygen with a negative two oxidation state because it's more electronegative than pretty much everything else. So if oxygen has the full valence, it's almost always going to be an oxidation state of negative two. If there's a peroxide bond involved, then that's, that's not going to be the case because anytime we've got a, a bond where we have an equal number of, of um, electronegativity on both sides, we're going to treat that like it's going to split up evenly. So one electron goes each direction. Um, so a peroxide bond, when you have an oxygen-oxygen bond, is going to throw, throw that off. And then for all of these, for hydrogens in an organic compound, hydrogen is always going to be plus one. Right, because hydrogen is less electronegative than everything else in an organic compound. Remember, hydrogen is right on our line for electronegativity between metals and nonmetals. So if you have hydrogen attached to a metal, it's always going to, the hydrogen would then have be more electronegative than the metal and would have a negative one charge. But if hydrogen's attached to anything nonmetal, Hydrogen is always going to be a plus one oxidation state. What would the oxidation state of hydrogen gas be? I'm going to go with zero again. <laughs> zero, nailed it. So for this one, because hydrogen is bound to itself and all hydrogens are exactly the same electronegativity, we'd split that bond right down the middle and each hydrogen would have one electron, which is where exactly where it is on the periodic table. Or you can think about it in terms of counting protons in the, in the nucleus as well. Um, and so the oxidation state of hydrogen gas is going to be zero. And the oxidation state of oxygen gas is also going to be zero for the same reasoning. All right, so we have we now have a way of sort of evaluating how stable these different things are because oxygen being so electronegative is going to be pretty much always going to be more stable when it's got a negative charge on it. 
spe specifically, it's going to be most stable when it's got a negative two charge. Hydrogen ha can have a, a range of oxidation states, and so can carbon. And it all has to do with how much oxygen is around, really. The more oxygen we have around, the more oxidized our carbon is. Right? That's, that's literally where the term oxidized comes from. Because when you put oxygen with pretty much anything, it steals the electrons. Um, so here's some common oxidation states for carbon. Specifically, these are all single carbon um, compounds. You can have carbon, we can actually see, can have anything from a negative four to a positive four. These ones are in. Um, all going by even numbers, but we can also have them have them be odd numbers as well, because if we have a carbon carbon bond where we're going to split up the electrons not as a pair, then we can wind up with carbons that have a you know a plus three or a minus three or a minus one oxidation state as well. And so we're going to use this to talk about not just the entire compound, just like with formal charge, but we're going to use this to talk about individual atoms within a compound the formal charge of that carbon, the formal charge of this oxygen. There might be other carbons and oxygens in the compound that are gonna have a different formal charge. So where this really becomes helpful is in determining whether something was an oxidation state or, or an oxidation reaction from the perspective of the carbon. Or usually this being organic chemistry, we care most about the organic compounds. So when I say this is an oxidation reaction, there's also a reduction that has to happen, but we're usually talking, when I say it's an oxidation reaction, I mean the carbon was oxidized or that something in that carbon-based compound was oxidized. Um, so let's, uh, we can use these oxidation states. And again, this is somewhat review. We're just applying it to new systems um, to say whether each of these reactions was your organic material oxidized, reduced, or neither. I'll give you guys a minute or two and then I'll, I'll work through the first one. And then you guys, if you're stuck, then you can keep going then. So for the acetone on the left, for A, the two methyl groups are both going to have an, a, an oxidation state of negative three because they have three carbon-hydrogen bonds and one carbon-carbon bond. Each, each carbon-hydrogen bond is two electrons, and the carbon is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so it controls both of them. So each methyl group, the carbon has control of six electrons. So actually I counted wrong, it's negative two for each of those. Right, no, one, two, six. Oh, seven, there's the seventh one. 
Um, then the last part is the carbon-carbon bond, which is split evenly. So if I zoom in on a methyl group, the carbon controls all of these. And half of those. So that's six electrons from the carbon hydrogen bonds plus one more electron from the evenly split carbon carbon bond. So seven electrons. And it has four on the periodic table. So each methyl is going to have an oxidation state of negative three. Then if we look at the at the carbonyl, each carbon carbon bond split evenly. So that's two electrons with the carbon controls. The carbon oxygen bond, carbon controls none of that. All of those belong to the oxygen. So the carbon only has control of two electrons here, the two electrons from the carbon-carbon bonds. And on the periodic table, again, the carbon has four electrons on the periodic table. It only has two here, which gives it a total plus two oxidation state. So in terms of, of um, learning to do this quickly and, and efficiently, every carbon-oxygen bond is going to be a plus one charge, a plus one oxidation state for, the, for a carbon. Every carbon-carbon bond is going to be neutral. And every carbon hydrogen bond is a negative one. All right, so you can you can sum these up by saying, okay, well, for the acetone, the methyl groups have three carbon hydrogen bonds. Each of those is a negative one. And the carbon carbon bonds are zero because they're they're equal. All right, and then anything, anytime you got a carbon oxygen bond or carbon bonded to anything more electronegative than carbon is, so it could be a nitrogen, could be a chlorine, that's going to be a plus one oxidation state because the carbon doesn't control any of those. So that carbon right in the middle on the acetone has a plus two charge. Chlorine's more electronegative than carbon is, right? So the carbon in the middle on that, on this side. Sorry, Sean. Yeah. Um, I'm, you lost me there for a minute. I'm sorry. So the carbon carbon bonds are worth zero, but then on that center carbon you're saying it's plus two because it because every carbon oxygen bond is a plus one and there's two carbon oxygen bonds so the carbon carbon bonds count for zero but there's also the carbon oxygen bonds you have to look at all four of the bonds on every carbon when we're doing this okay because when you drew it out it looked like you were like oh all of those go to the oxygen so they, so they do, let me draw it out again. Okay. So all of these go to the oxygen. The carbon gets to keep half of the electrons from the carbon-carbon bond, which means that the reason I said that that counts as a zero in terms of oxidation state is because that's going to wind up being being a wash. It's not gaining electrons or losing electrons from those covalent bonds. 
it brought one electron to that covalent bond and it still has control of that because it's exactly equal electronegativity wise. Mm -hmm. So in terms of talking about the oxidation state of this carbon, the carbon-carbon bonds are a wash. Okay. So that's why I said that they're, they're zero. I'm not saying I, it has zero electrons in them. I'm just saying that it's going to add up to being neutral because it brought one electron to that carbon-carbon bond and it still has control of one electron. And so then the plus two is just from the carbon-oxygen bond? Right. So if we have a, if we look at just the number of electrons here for the carbon, we get there's two carbon carbon bonds that are each one electron and it can it still has a full valence but it doesn't control any of those electrons oxygen is in control of those electrons because it's more electronegative and so really the the carbon only has a total of two electrons around it that it controls fully which means that its overall oxidation state is a plus two because it started with four electrons on the periodic table, and now it only has two electrons that okay. it controls. Okay, so when we're looking at this, we're not looking at the bonds for that center carbon, because it would be zero if we were looking at the oxidation state. If we're looking at the formal charge, the formal charge is zero. The oxidation state is plus two. Okay. Okay. All right, so oxidation state is like getting more granular and more specific about where the electron density is. Mm -hmm. If everything has a full valence, so we're not going to say that anything has a formal charge, but the, the carbon still doesn't control as much of the electrons as it could. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because it's just like we were talking about the the carbon carbon bonds, and then I guess now we're just talking about electrons. It's just kind of confusing. It's so the same way that with formal charge, we can look at a carbon and say, okay, well that carbon's got four bonds, therefore it has a full valence, therefore mm -hmm. the formal charge is zero. Mm -hmm. With this, this is just getting a little bit more specific about the types of bonds and say, okay, well the carbon's still got four bonds, still got a full valence. Mm -hmm. But it's still getting electrons pulled away from it because some of those electron, some of those uh, electrons are in carbon oxygen bonds, and the carbon oxygen bonds, the oxygen really controls them. Okay. Yeah. And, and so it's it's also it's another way of sort of looking at where where a partial charge a partial charge is. Maybe that's a good way of framing this. Um, the partial charge on an acetone, you're gonna have a partial positive on the carbonyl carbon because the oxidation state of that carbon is a plus two. The oxidation state on the, on the methyl carbons, we wouldn't say that that has any partial charge at all to it really, right? Because we have all nonpolar bonds really. So seeing that these have an oxidation state of negative three for all of the methyls, but then you've got a positive two on that one in the middle. If we were looking for a place where a nucleophile would attack, it's gonna attack that, that carbon that's got that plus two charge, that plus two oxidation state. So if we're looking at these this reaction and we want to know whether or not the oxidation or whether or not it was a redox reaction or not well anything that doesn't change the methyls don't change from from reactant to product so we know that they weren't oxidized or reduced right regardless of whether it was a plus three or or whatever if nothing changed on that specific carbon then we know it wasn't a redox reaction it wasn't a reaction at all for the methyls really right and in that carbon in the middle, the number two carbon, it went from a plus two oxidation state to also a plus two oxidation state. We have because we have just as many carbon to electronegative atoms bonds as we did before. We had two carbon oxygen bonds, now we have two carbon chlorine bonds. 
So a reaction definitely happened, but it wasn't a redox reaction. Because the oxidation state on the carbon didn't change. The easiest way, if you beyond, if you don't need to actually put a number to whether um, it was to the oxidation state before and after, is did I add more carbon bonds to something more electronegative? If you add carbon oxygen bonds, it was oxidized. If you took away carbon oxygen bonds, it was reduced. Right, that gets a little hazy when you're replacing the carbon oxygen bonds with something that's that's almost as electronegative like part A. But for most organic chemistry, especially when you look at biochem, this shows up all the time in biochem. This is how the electron transport chain works. You start breaking down glucose and you get it progressively more oxidized. You start with glucose and you start take you start taking away carbon hydrogen bonds and carbon carbon bonds and replacing them with carbon oxygen bonds. So you go from something that has a certain oxidation state and you start oxidizing it progressively. That's literally why we need to breathe oxygen in order to metabolize sugar is because you need an oxygen source that's gonna be able to come in and oxidize the glucose in a controlled way. Right, so just counting how many carbon oxygen bonds you have is usually going to be good enough for figuring out if something was oxidized or reduced. And what I mean by that is for part B, this carbon in the middle, or the, the aldehyde carbon, starts with two carbon oxygen bonds. And if we wanted to figure out the oxidation state just for practice, since we're practicing that, well, we'll do that in a second. Just let me show you the general trick. We added an extra carbon oxygen bond, right? When we took it from an aldehyde to the acid. If we added an extra polar bond, we oxidized the compound. We added an extra oxygen in. Makes sense that the word oxidized would mean that, right? Um, if we wanted to actually establish um, what the oxidation state is before and after, for the aldehyde, we can blow it up here so we can see all the bonds. Carbon carbon bond is going to break in the middle, so that doesn't count as a plus one or a minus one. Each carbon oxygen bond is a, is a plus one charge for the carbon, right? Because, or if we think about it, is the oxygen has all of those electrons. The carbon has, not one, has none of them. And then the carbon controls both of the electrons in the carbon hydrogen bond. So the carbon has a total of three electrons that it controls in terms of oxidation state, right? If the carbon controls three electrons, and on the periodic table, it has four electrons, we have one fewer electron than we started with, right? So our oxidation state at the beginning would be a plus one. What's our oxidation state at the end going to be? Plus three, good. We took away that carbon hydrogen bond and replaced it with the carbon oxygen bond. And so now instead of carbon being able to control those two electrons, um, the oxygen, the new oxygen that we just added 
is going to control those. So if we go from a if we go from a plus one to a plus three, the carbon was oxidized or reduced. We added an oxygen, right? Oxidized, yeah. Oxidized. Rem our our old mnemonics from or however you say that word, I can never say that word, right? Exactly. Oil rig. Oxidation is loss. Or Leo the lion says grr, right? Lose elect electrons is oxidation. They, those still apply, but when we're in biochem or in organic chemistry, we're usually, rather than talking about actual actually losing electrons, everything still has a full valence. And there's, so it's, we're not just looking sh specifically at something was a zero charge before. It's not just as easy as looking at metals, right? So we have to do this oxidation state or count carbon oxygen bonds before and after. If we go from an acid to an alcohol, we we lost carbon oxygen bonds, right? So in the alcohol, the carbon controls more of the electrons because there are fewer carbon oxygen bonds. So that's a reduction. Right. And again, if you wanted more practice with this, this is the same compound we just did, right? So it's still going to be a plus three. If we wanted to zoom in to see that. In the, in the carboxylic acid, the carbon has a, um, it doesn't control any of the electrons that in the carbon oxygen bonds. So the carbon only has one electron from that carbon carbon bond that's split. And if carbon only can controls one electron, it's got to have a plus three. For ethanol, Got a carbon carbon bond that counts for nothing, two carbon hydrogen bonds that are each going to give the carbon a negative one, and a carbon oxygen bond that gives the carbon a plus one. So this gives us a negative one oxidation state. In general, especially in terms of biochem, things are most stable when they're all the way oxidized, which means all of our fuel molecules, all of the molecules that provide energy to the cell are going to be fairly reduced. The oxidative phosphorylation is how eukaryotes pr produce pretty much all of their ATP, right? Oxidative stands for, we're gonna take something and oxidize it and use those high energy electrons that were on the, the more reduced form we're going to use those high energy electrons to make ATP. Right, so photosynthesis and pretty much anything where you're producing high energy molecules is going to be a reduction reaction. Anything where you're generating ATP is going to be a oxidation reaction or at least the re reactions that then lead to ATP synthase. It's, you know, it's more complicated than just one reaction makes one ATP, right? But it's all of those reactions that head down that electron transport chain pathway are going to be oxidizing those, those energy rich carbon molecules. So photosynthesis reduces things. That's, and that's also usually what's meant by 
Um, you might hear the term called carbon fixing. Um, well, maybe that's more of an engineering term. Carbon fixing is the process of taking CO2, carbon in its most stable state, and reducing it. So photosynthesis is one form of carbon fixing. Um, anytime you're trying that uh, a lot of the technologies that, the, that people are talking about trying to reduce CO2 um, presence in the atmosphere, a lot of those are carbon fixing as well, especially if you're trying to take CO2 and make a fuel out of it. Um, that's sort of a, a holy grail technology. If you could take CO2 from the air and turn it into methanol that we could then burn as a fuel, then you have a you have a fuel that's a liquid that burns um, that we could use to power an engine in theory if we redesign our engines a little bit that's carbon neutral because you started by taking the carbon out of the air and then when you burn it you put the carbon back in the air but at least you're not taking carbon from fossil fuels underground and then releasing it to the air so a carbon carbon fixing is a really big Part of that nitrogen fixing you hear about nitrogen fixing as well that's what uh, legumes do legumes um, are really good crops for restoring nitrogen con um, content in soil because they have these little nodules on their roots that um, that bacteria live in and these specific bacteria are called cyanobacteria um, the other term for them is nitrogen fixing bacteria because they take nitrogen from the air and they can turn it into nitrates. So they're taking the nitrogen in the air, and which is it's a very stable form, um, and they're actually oxidizing the nitrogen in that case um, to make nitrates, which is the more usable form for, for life. Um, but a lot of time, these redox reactions will wind up being really important, um, both in terms of oxidizing things to make energy, but also in that case, reducing nitrogen to make nitrates because nitrates are necessary for life as well. All right, this page is looking pretty messy. Um, well, the reaction that we're going to see the most this chapter when it comes to these reduction or in oxidation reactions um, is if we start with a carbonyl, we can produce an alcohol if we have a reducing agent around. So this is similar to, to the last page of the test. The last page of a test took, took a carbonyl and turned it to an alcohol, right? So that's that's it was a reduction reaction um and so we'll, we will see that as a really common theme now that we're getting into carbonyls is a carbonyl is a good target for something with a lot of electrons because you've got a partial positive on that carbon which means something a good nucleophile can come in there and attack it if depending on what your nucleophile is, that can result in a reduction reaction. Um, and so we're going to have a couple common reducing agents that we use. Um, and in general, what they're going to do is it's it's just like that addition reaction, um, except that we're going to wind up adding a we're going to wind up breaking that carbon oxygen pi bond or replacing it with something else. What would we need if we were trying to make a tertiary alcohol though? If we did this to a ketone, we could wind up making a secondary alcohol. If we did this to an aldehyde, we could make a, ter a primary alcohol. How could we do this to make, well, it says right on there that you can't, why can't you do that? Why can't you make a tertiary alcohol this way, Cody? Because you can't have more than, you can't have pi bonds on a tertiary carbon. Maybe if you right. had a good leaving group, you could replace it with an alcohol. Right, so we can't, we can't produce a tertiary alcohol with the straight up reduction because that would mean we were starting from a carbonyl that had five bonds. That just looks, looks wrong, right? 
unless you're using your imagination and that's a bacteriophage um, or something like that, that's, that molecule does not look right. Um, so we are not going to make tertiary alcohols this way. I'll show you guys a process that's still technically a reduction, but it's not what one of our common reductions. Um, that are one of the comp the reactions we would refer to as a reducing agent necessarily. So reducing agents are things that are going to break a carbonyl bond and turn it into an alcohol. Um, the most obvious of these is hydrogenation. That's what we did to break a pi bond and add a hydrogen on each side if it was an alkene, right? Or an alkyne. We just said, well, put, put a bunch of hydrogen gas in there with a catalyst, right? Or do your dissolving metal reaction, or might have to use a Lindler catalyst if we we're trying to do that, that specific alkyne partial hydrogenation. Um, but with carbonyls, carbon oxygen bonds are so stable that that's really hard to do. So we don't see this very often in, in um, with carbonyls because we can get to decent yields, 95%, um, but we're talking about you need to do this reaction at something like 800 Celsius. Um, and that means you have to keep a contained gas at 800 Celsius. And now you're getting to the point where um, you can't do it in a glass setup. And plus, you also have to have high, high pressures of hydrogen to force it towards equilibrium towards the right. Um, so this is just not very practical, especially if we're talking about in a lab um, where you might not have a specialized, you know, thick walled stainless steel um, reactive vessel. This, this can be done in industry um, where you have more specialized equipment designed for doing this, but in a lab, we don't have that, most labs. So we need a better way of doing that. And the most common way of doing that is use what's called a hydride source. Instead of using hydrogen gas, if you use sodium borohydride, Remember what we uh, just talked about hydrogen is always a plus one when it's attached to a non-metal, right? Well, boron, uh, boron's still technically a non-metal, but it's a metalloid. And if you look at the electronegativity, hydrogen is actually more electronegative than boron is. So that means that when you have boron with four hydrogens around it, each of those hydrogens has a negative one oxidation state. And each one of those hydrogens can then act as a reducing agent. Each of those hydrogens is going to be attracted to a partial positive. And so what, we, what you see the mechanism winds up being is that you wind up with the negative charge for each of these um, hydrides comes in and attaches to the carbonyl carbon. And then you wind up making BH3, which is more stable. And you wind up with that pi bond. We can't just make that bond without breaking the pi bond. So we actually wind up with an intermediate that would look like this, and we have our new hydrogen bond that we just brought in there. Right. And so then this, the second step is just an, a proton transfer step. You need some water or methanol or ethanol around just as a proton source um, that can then, that our oxygen can then steal an, a proton from. So if we had a second step would look something like Something like that. The negative charge on that oxygen then can grab a proton away from whatever protic solvent is around, whether it's water or methanol or ethanol. Right, so we wind up with a, 
a pretty straightforward mechanism for this, all things considered. It looks a little bit different, but essentially what we're doing is we're, it's an addition reaction. What makes it look weird is that our electrophile at the beginning, or sorry, our nucleophile at the beginning is a, hydri is a hydride. And it's going to be attracted to that partial positive on the carbonyl. And so this is a reduction reaction because we replaced a carbon oxygen bond with a carbon hydrogen bond. All right, so anytime you see sodium borohydride, it's pretty much always going to be a reducing agent. And usually it's just, it's going to be a reducing agent that just winds up giving away a hydride, an H minus ion. If you have an H minus ion around, find wherever your partial positive is and your hydrogen is going to attack it. And hydrogen is one of the reasons why we have that nomenclature where when, when something um, is an ion that has a negative charge, we name it differently than something that has a positive charge. So a hydrogen, a hydrogen ion is H plus. A hydride ion is H minus. Right, because I always means a negative charge. Um, and there are a variety of, of hydride sources. Here's the mechanism drawn out a little bit better. Nucleophilic attack by the hydride, then a proton transfer. Um, this reaction only works for ketones and aldehydes, though. Carboxylic acids and what are called the acid derivatives. And acid derivatives are anything where you've got a carbonyl and another more um, another atom that's more electronegative than carbon attached. So if it's a carbonyl and if this was if X was a nitrogen, that'd be an amide. If if X is a chloride, we call that an acid chloride. If it's an OH, that's a carboxylic acid. What else am I missing? If it was an O and then another um, R group, that's an ester. Right. So all of those groups, that entire group of carbonyl compounds where you have a carbonyl and then something else electronegative also are all in the same category and they're all referred to as acid derivatives because you can make all of them from the acid form pretty easily. You can convert back and forth between all of those pretty easily because it's not a redox reaction. So this only works for aldehydes and ketones. If we want to do this with a carboxylic acid, we have to get a much more powerful reducing agent. So lithium aluminum hydride, your hydride is a much better reducing agent because aluminum is even less electronegative than boron. So this looks a lot like sodium borohydride, except we have the hydrogens attached to something even less electronegative. So this is an even better reducing agent. It's going to act the same way, but it can react with pretty much everything. Um, lithium aluminum hydride will react with water in the just in the air. If you do this in an open in an open container in lab, um, you'll probably wind up with the lithium aluminum hydride catching on fire before you can actually even add it. Um, so it has to be done very very carefully. Um, and under, and you have to be very careful to expose the lithium aluminum hydride to as little um, water specifically, but also any protic solvent is going to react with the lithium aluminum hydride. So it has to be done as a separate step. But the mechanism works the same way. If it's something like an aldehyde, we probably wouldn't do this because lithium aluminum hydride is so nasty and so, so dangerous. Um, but if we had something that was, harder to reduce something like an acid that we wanted to reduce, 
lithium aluminum hydride is the way to do it. All right, so just to recap before we take our break, if we started from this molecule in the middle, if we wanted to reduce that, if we reduced it by just exposing it to hydrogen with the catalyst, we'd reduce all of the pi bonds, right? We would hydrogenate the carbon-carbon pi bond. We'd also hydrogenate the carbon-oxygen pi bond. So we would get a very, very reduced molecule if we did that. That's not usually what we want. A lot of times we want just one reactive group to react at a time. If we wanted the hydrogen to react, or sorry, if we wanted the alkene to react, we would do an addition reaction that we've talked about before. If we want the carbonyl to react, we can selectively reduce just the carbonyl using either of the two reactions we just talked about. They're both going to work the same way. They're both going to produce, provide an H minus, a hydride, that attaches to the carbonyl. Right, so all of that said, we, we really only added one reaction here. We just have two possibilities for how to do it. Sodium boral hydride or lithium aluminum hydride. Sean, I have a question about that one. What's with the sodium boral hydride, what's protonating it? Because it looks like it's in methoxide or methanol, I mean. So it's in methanol, so the methanol is going to provide oh, your Oh, okay. Your yeah, I, wasn't, I was thinking as a, as a nucleophile, but never mind. So always want to be paying attention to that, but methanol is not a good enough nucleophile to attack the carbonyl, but it is a it's a good enough acid that your your oxide ion that we're making can pull a proton away from it. And I just like this. I thought this was a good way to remember lithium aluminum hydride will reduce anything. Sodium boral hydride is pretty good at reducing things, but it can't do acids. Right, so lithium aluminum hydride is Surter? Surter. You know your North, Norse mythology, fire giant that sets fire to the entire world at the in, in Ragnarok. Sodium boral hydride's pretty strong. All right, we'll take our break there. And we'll talk about how that all looks and do some practice with these when we come back. So let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at five after. Yeah, just gonna mention, I think we do already have engines that run off of uh, methane. I worked on one at a wastewater treatment plant that was a generator that ran off the methane that was produced there. Methane, yes, methanol. I don't think methanol burns at a hot enough temperature. Um, oh yeah. And that turns out that last reduction step to go from methanol to methane is is both is problematic for a few reasons. One, it's really it's harder to get that last step, removing that last oxygen bond. And two, when you do that and you make methane, now you have to store methane, which is a gas. Methanol being a liquid is a lot easier to store and transport. And methane, you have to transport it in a cylinder, right? Um, right. So that that provides a whole different can of worms when it comes to infrastructure. Um, but yes, we're they're working on that and they're working on finding ways we could then use that either use that methanol that we could make as a liquid as in in fuel cells potentially, um, or just use it only for burning if we you know for heat, for instance. Um, yeah, is the problem it's not energy dense enough or? Basically, yeah, it burns at too low of a temperature and there's not enough energy in it. And so you can't really, and it burns too slowly when, um, until you get up to really high temperatures. Um, they do use methanol though, now that I think about it, um, in uh, Formula One cars, I think. Huh. So maybe, the, so there's probably just need to change the, um, the engineering on the, on the engines. You could probably design, I know they, Methanol burns with a with a colorless flame, usually, so you can't see it when it's burning. Um, and hmm. so, and if you see 
um, car wrecks in Formula One, a lot of times there's a, a an invisible fire that they have to put out before they can pull the person out. Oh, wow. Um, so I know that they they use it in some form in Are engines. Are you familiar with those uh, rotary style engines? I mean, vaguely. It's a pretty interesting concept. I've heard they use those for like funny car races and stuff too. Yeah, Mazda uses them, has always used them. And there's a difference between, there's a radial engine and a rotary engine are actually different. Um, the rotary engines are the ones that Mazda uses that have three strokes instead of just a V, a V where they go, where they're perpendicular to each other and they're firing to rotate it. They're at, they're at um, 60 degrees from each other and there's three of them. So you have three pistons causing your your gear shaft to rotate in three strokes instead of two um and i want to say that the radial engines there's basically no limit to it uh and so they used to use those on um old prop planes um like the you get crazy high rpms and stuff yeah so like yeah all the all the old single engine fighters from world war ii um were a big chunk of those actually they might have started phasing. i think i read something so they started phasing those out right at the beginning of world war ii but you if you can think of those single prop planes where they it looked like their engine was circular the kind of right behind where the prop was yeah i've um, seen those yeah that's that's what those are those are i think they call those ones radial not rotary they're radial engines or something like that yeah, the one that I'm thinking of has got like a almost triangular shaped circular piece instead of like pistons yeah. and the, yeah, the different flat sides, see the compression and stuff. I think you can get ridiculous high RPMs with those too, like 17, 20,000 or something. Right, and so it might, might take the, the difference would be basically, um, would be basically the, we'd need to change the engineering because methanol burning a little bit slower is going to mean that your um is going to mean that you need to have more cylinders per rotation so that might be the way way around it where you can change the you could do something like this um where you wind up with the cylinders firing every other rotation if you have a total of 10 cylinders, but only five fire each rotation, that gives the other five a longer time to recover and fill back up. Yeah, and I. now that I see that, I think I'm using the wrong vocabulary. I don't think it's a rotary engine that I'm talking about. So, no, no, I think you are using the right one. This is a radial one. I, I just oh, Googled okay. radial versus rotary and clicked on Wikipedia. Um, radial is, usually you see them, the Mazda ones are only three, three strokes, but it looks like these more high performance ones are a little bit, oh, that gave it, I did rotary redirect to radial. Um, there is a separate one for, for the, maybe they don't, not making very many of the three stroke ones, these ones. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. Um, and that gives you a little bit of different possibility because you don't have to have it as cylinders per se. You can have one reaction chamber where this rolling um, engine, it's it's a different type of, of stroke. You know, it's not just out and in. Having that rotation in there allows you to fill it up from both sides. Um, and have have it sealed differently. But I don't know enough about the engineering. I, I didn't take enough mechanical engineering classes to really be able to um, answer this in great detail. The difference between a straight a straight six versus a V versus a radial. Um, and in both cases, the radial and the rotary, you can get to those crazy high RPMs and can make more use of lower fuel density or lower energy density in your fuel because you can you can get better um 
you can get the the piston to rotate or the crank to rotate um, more efficiently because each cylinder only needs to contribute a lot less energy. Yeah, kind of less overall stress on things. Yeah. We're a little tangent, man. Just I hadn't yeah. thought about one of those engines in a long time or that water treatment plant having a flashback. Like, I remember working at that stinky ass place. <laughs> yeah. All right, I gotta fill up my water cup though. Be right back. Hello, man. All right, you can go ahead and bring back real quick. Um, if you are looking for a fun YouTube stream to watch after uh, after class is over, um, I highly recommend tuning into the live streamed landing of Perseverance on Mars, um, which if you just Google Perseverance NASA, um, the, NASA's website will come up and they have a countdown on there and a, and a CGI rendering of 
um, what this is going to look like. Clearly, we don't have a camera like this on the surface of Mars, so we won't be getting this angle. Um, but they're going to be live streaming this um, from the from the lander's um, point of view. Um, and interesting side note, as long as we're talking about random engineering things, um, does anybody know why they don't just use parachutes for Mars? Not enough atmosphere? Not enough atmosphere. I think the atmosphere on Mars is only about 10% of our, of our atmosphere. Um, maybe even a little bit less, might be more like 8%. So basically parachutes wouldn't slow it down enough. The terminal velocity is still too high because there's just not enough air resistance. Um, so what they have to do instead is they use a parachute to slow it down a little bit, but then they have to use what they call a sky crane, um, which is basically they have to lower the lander down um, from a spacecraft. It looks a lot like the uh, SpaceX launches. Um, where they, they use a controlled burn to slow themselves down instead of just using a parachute. Um, also interesting piece about this is they're also bringing a helicopter. Um, and helicopters also have to work very differently on Mars because of the low atmosphere. Um, and plus they need it to be as small as possible. So they couldn't use a traditional helicopter structure where you have a, a main rotor and then a stabilizer in the back. Um, so they have to have two rotors rotating in opposite directions. Um, and, and the rotors have to be designed to different specifications than on Earth because of that lower, um, lower pressure. The propellers are going to be, need to be generating a lot more, well, the same amount of lift, but they have less air to do it with. Um, so the, if you look at that, they, the size of the blades is actually a lot wider than it would be on Earth. Um, for that reason. So very interesting. This would be the, their, the first powered flight on Mars, um, assuming that this works properly and that the landing goes well. They basically just strapped it to the, to the belly of the rover. If you watch that other CGI animation, that little thing, that little black thing right there on, on the bottom of the rover is the, is the helicopter. Um, so, and this is all happening in less than four hours. They're going to be live streaming. It will be on a, I think it's about an eight minute tape delay, I think, um, from Mars right now because of the, um, the distance. It takes about eight minutes for light to get from Mars to us, which means it takes eight minutes for radio signals to get to us from Mars. Um, although depending on where Mars is right now, it might be more like 15 minutes. I think when Mars and, and, Let's see, Mars is, you can see Mars in the middle of the night right now. That means we're pretty close to Mars. So it's going to be at least a couple minute delay between Mars and Earth, just based on the speed of light. Uh, it's also kind of fun when you get into the having to, um, you know, even when your signal is moving at the speed of light, it still takes a couple minutes to get to you. That's kind of fun, exciting. Um, and that's why it all has to be done and all has to be pre-programmed before you get before it gets there because you can't rely on somebody piloting it like a drone um, because we wouldn't have fast enough reflexes. The tape delay for a signal to get to us and then us to send signal back to Mars is long enough that you wouldn't be able to land a plane or a, a rover that way. So it all has to be done, um, run by computers. If we had a manned space flight, that might be different, but um we don't at this point all right so let's start by let's bring back to ochem um by drawing the products for these reduction reactions remember for for any carbonyl especially for an aldehyde or a ketone lithium aluminum hydride is going to work by breaking the carbon oxygen pi bonds and then the second step is just to protonate the oxygen that's left. So if we want to draw the mechanism here, the first step would be the hydride
comes in and attaches to the carbonyl carbon, which breaks the carbon oxygen pi bond. So we get an intermediate that looks like that looks like this. And then step two is we expose it to water, which is going to have the rest of the aluminum hydride react and make some, some other more oxidized form of the lithium aluminum hydride. And it's also going to, to be a proton source. All right, so your, your oxygen with the negative charge that was the carbonyl oxygen grabs a proton um, from the water. Water keep the water oxygen keeps its electrons, so we wind up making the alcohol. So we added two hydrogens. We added one hydrogen to the carbonyl carbon and broke a carbon-oxygen bond. So this is definitely a reduction reaction because we're removing a carbon-oxygen bond and replacing it with carbon-hydrogen bond. All right, the oxidation state on the oxygen doesn't change though, right? Because the oxygen was negative two before and it's still more electronegative than anything else on there. So the oxygen is still gonna have an oxidation state of negative two. Our mechanism is going to look very similar here. Hydride comes in. Attacks the carbonyl carbon, but you need to make room for it. So our intermediate would look like and we add it in. It's not strictly necessary to show the new hydrogen there. It's implied if you don't draw it, but it's a good idea since we're not used to using hydrides as nucleophiles yet to draw your new carbon hydrogen bond while you get used to it. And then the second step would just protonate that So we turn the carbonyl into an alcohol. All right, so for aldehydes and ketones, the mechanism and um, the products look the same regardless of if you're using lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride. They're gonna be the exact same steps. So going back to this cheat sheet, we're going to selectively hydrogenate just the carbonyl. These, because this is a nucleophilic attack, this starts with the nucleophilic attack of the hydride attacking the partial positive. It's not going to attack a carbon-carbon a double bond because that's a, an electron rich area. So there's no partial positive for the hydride to attack. So we, we wind up selectively just hydrogenating the carbonyl when we go through this process. If we go through a hydrogenation step, that hydrogenates every pi bond in there. But going through this, using the reducing agents that have hydrides means that we're only going to reduce the carbonyls.
So lithium aluminum hydride reduces pretty much everything that has a carbonyl. Um, and it gets, but it gets a little bit weird when we start getting to things that are esters because we wind up with more than one product. It's not quite a cleavage reaction, but it's kind of similar. So for A, we're just going to replace that carbonyl with an OH. So we're just wind up taking butanaldehyde to butanol. And if it's a carboxylic acid, the mechanism is going to look a little different. We'll talk about that in a second. But, um, but it's the net result is going to be the same. All right. And so, but it gets a little bit weird when we have an ester or if we have one of those other acid derivatives, because we need to figure out where the rest of this is going to. Right, probably all, all the rest of these, we wind up breaking the carbonyl pi bond and replacing it with an alcohol. We need to figure out what else is going to happen though to know what, what our other product is going to be. All right, so our mechanism for this, it's longer, but it's not actually all that different. We start with a nucleophilic attack, just like before. Hydride attacks the carbonyl carbon, and you make this, they refer to this as a tetrahedral intermediate. We wind up making this, this um, sp3 carbon. But then if we have a, a, an acid derivative, we have a good leaving group already. This, this methyl group, or whatever, if it's a, a um, a chlor it could be a chloride there, it could be a nitrogen there. Regardless, this is a pretty good leaving group. And so rather than, than just going straight from, okay, we added our hydrogen, now we're going to come in and add our, our proton to that, it actually reforms the carbonyl for a second. It goes through successive steps. You take your acid derivative, and first thing you do is turn it into an aldehyde by having your leaving group leave. And then we just do the same thing. Then we have our same, now we have an aldehyde. We, we need more lithium aluminum hydride. The stoichiometry is different if we're, if we're reducing an acid derivative versus an aldehyde. We need a two to one ratio instead of a, a one to one ratio of the aluminum hydride. But then once we get to that aldehyde, once our leaving group leaves, this is the exact same mechanism we just went through. Nucleophilic attack by the hydride, and then you do a proton transfer. You just have to go through that first reduction step. And your, so your first reduction step is you make this tetrahedral intermediate, and then a leaving group leaves. And once you do that, now we're at an aldehyde, and we're in familiar territory. Lithium aluminum hydride reacts again to make it tetrahedral again, and then it stays that way. And you just wind up with your oxygen needs a, needs a proton. So lithium aluminum hydride will take an aldehyde, convert it to an alcohol. It'll take a carboxylic acid and convert it to an alcohol. It'll take an ester and convert it to, so this was an ester to start, carbonyl to an oxygen to another carbon. When we break up an ester, we're going to get two products. And in this case, they're both going to be alcohols. Right? Because we're going to wind up with our methanol that leaves is still floating around at the end. So to go back here. If we want to know what the, what the product is we're going to chop that section off and turn it to methanol. And then we're going to take what's left and convert it to a primary alcohol as well. 
So it's going, the first step is going to be that we convert it from an ester to an aldehyde. And then we're going to take that aldehyde and react it one step further to the alcohol. All right, so not all that different. We just have to be paying attention to We just have to be paying attention to what else is attached to that carbonyl carbon. And if it's something that has carbon that is uh, another carbon-based molecule, we probably want to be paying attention to it um, and writing it as one of our products. Because, you know, OCAM, yeah, we get sloppy when it comes to balancing reactions and byproducts. Um, but anything that's carbon, got carbon in it, we want to keep track of that in our final product. So our total would be. You know, write your methanol however you prefer, MeOH or CH3OH, but we're going to get both of those alcohols as a result. And just because I couldn't pick just one meme for this one, lithium aluminum hydride lends itself to memes well. If you have lithium aluminum hydride around, you're not going to have any carbonyls left at the end. Your lithium aluminum hydride just destroys carbonyls. Um, it reduces pretty much anything you put it with. If you put it with water, it reduces the water and produces hydrogen gas and hydroxide. If you put it with anything, it's going to reduce it, with the exception of you can't further reduce the alcohols. So once you get to methanol, there's still one more carbon oxygen bond, but lithium aluminum hydride even can't remove that OH at the end. So you get stuck at, with that oxygen at the end um, because lithium aluminum hydride is just not reactive enough to do that. If you want to get rid of an OH group, um, if you want to get rid of an alcohol and go all the way to the fully reduced product, it takes a lot more work um, and is an even nastier reactions. But we can talk about more tricky nucleophiles. Um, so lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride were both ways we could turn hydrogen into a nucleophile. Grignard reagents are a way we can turn carbons into nucleophiles. So this gives us another way of changing the carbon skeleton um, other than using the acetylide. So a lot of times this is actually going to be our more efficient way of, of adding carbons to something rather than using that acetylide pathway where you had to make an acetylide and then figure out how to hydrogenate it the right way. Um, Grignard reagents are tricky to use um, because they do degrade really, really quickly. Um, but basically what a Grignard reagent does is you just expose an alkyl bromide or a phenyl bromide to magnesium metal in the absence of water. And you, you wind up basically putting the magnesium in between the halide and the carbon you wind up making a covalent bond between the carbon and the magnesium. And carbon is significantly more electronegative than magnesium is. So that all of a sudden you have a carbon with a partial negative, which we haven't seen before, right? Our carbons have all been partial positives when we have something attached to them because carbon is less electronegative than pretty much everything. If it's an oxygen or a chloride or a bromide, that all of those things are going to give carbon a partial positive. A Grignard reagent gives carbon a partial negative, 
which means it can be a nucleophile. Um, and I remember always being confused about how I'm supposed to pronounce this. It's Grignard, like, like lasagna. I don't know if Grignard is an Italian name, but you pronounce it like it's an Italian name. Um, with that G-N is like an N-Y in, uh, in Spanish. It's like an N-Y. So Grignard. It's not, not a Grignard. Just like it's not lasagna. All right, so the, I don't know, does anybody know any other languages that where the GN is pronounced as a, with a Y in there? I don't, can't think of any others. So I think this is probably an Italian name, but there might be some other languages that do that as well. There we go. Um, so these Grignard reagents are gonna wind up being a really, really common way to change our carbon structure because we, we're getting really good at nucleophilic attack, right? Nucleophilic, if you have a nucleophile, you find the partial positive on your target molecule and then you just attach it there. Whether it's a substitution or, or anything, um, your negative charge on a, basically we can just treat it like it's a, carbo, car, a carbon ion. So the opposite of a carbocation is a carbanion, a carbon with a negative charge. And it, just like the hydride, this is the exact same mechanism as our hydride attack, except it's with a carbon instead of a hydrogen. So this is going to be our way for making tertiary alcohols. It's still a reduction reaction, but because we're not using hydrides, it's not reducing it as much. Um, but the, the overall step is your Grignard reagent attacks the carbonyl partial positive, which breaks the carbon oxygen pi bond. You make that, that tetrahedral carbon now, and then you just do a quick proton transfer to protonate it. Right. So given, given how often we use alkyl halides, alkyl bromides especially, this is a really useful tool in synthesis because anytime you've got something with a partial positive, you can have a Grignard reagent come in and attach. And then that allows us to add a methyl group or add an ethyl group wherever there's a carbonyl. And we can wind up with this happening more than once. If we, this is another reaction for acid derivatives. Basically, you're going to convert this to a alcohol like before. And we're going to replace, just like before, we replaced both of the carbon oxygen bonds that we broke. We replaced both of them with hydrogens if we use lithium aluminum hydride. If we use excess Grignard reagent, we can replace both of those carbon oxygen bonds with carbon-carbon bonds. So changing what your Grignard reagent is, is it methyl magnesium bromide or is it ethyl magnesium bromide or is it phenyl magnesium bromide with a benzene ring attached, is gonna change what we stuck on here, what this red group is, but it's the same mechanism every time. Right? You, you have something with a negative charge that comes in here, attaches to the carbonyl oxygen. If we have it a good leaving group, the leaving group leaves and we do it again. All right, so here's the mechanism drawn out, and it should look really, really similar to the one we just did for lithium aluminum hydride. Nucleophilic attack, you make that tetrahedral intermediate, which then reforms to a carbonyl. But then you do it again. 
negative charge attacks, wind up breaking that carbon oxygen pi bond, and then you just protonate. Right? We don't have a good leaving group once we get to this second tetrahedral intermediate, so it won't reform the carbonyl. Once you don't have a good leaving group, it's going to stay this way, and you're just going to have to protonate the oxygen. All right, so if we want to make a tertiary alcohol, starting from anywhere you want, how would we use a Grignard reagent to make this compound? Right, and so the trick is start by figuring out what the carbonyl would have to be and what the R group is that you're going to add. And there are multiple possibilities for this one. I'll give you a second to think about that, and then we'll go over it. All right, so color code this. Any of the three R groups attached to the alcohol carbon could be our R group that we use as a Grignard reagent. So we could use. And so whichever one of those is going to be the Grignard reagent, we just leave the other two R groups on there. So if we wanted to have phenyl magnesium bromide as our Grignard reagent, the blue and the yellow would still be attached, right? So we would just start with So we could start from 2-butanone and react it with magnesium, phenyl magnesium bromide to get that product. Or we could pick any other combination that we wanted. There's going to be three possible ways we could do this because there are three possible reactants that we could use as our Grignard reagent. So it really depends on, in this case, it depends on what you have in the stock room. You know, it, do we want to use ethyl bromide or do we want to use methyl bromide? to make our Grignard reagent. And that depends on which compound we have to start with. For instance, and what's cheap, frankly, because a benzene ring to a carbonyl to ethane or to an ethyl group is a different compound, right? I believe this might be benzophenone. Um, if we look at the various possibilities here, Let's see, one of these, I believe, has a common name. I believe it's a methyl group. That is acetophenone. That's a pretty common compound, pretty cheap to buy. So you might want to start with this as your starting ketone and then use ethyl bromide to make your Grignard reagent. However, if you happen to have this compound in the stock room instead, the 
propiophenone. It's going to be less common. Um, if, but if this is what you have in the stock room or that you can buy for cheap or that there's a naturally occurring product, you might want to start here and use the methyl magnesium bromide. Right. So it gives us a possibility, a lot of possibilities for where we're starting um, based on what we have access to. We have different ways of getting to the same product, depending on what we start with. And all of these, though, are going to make the racemic mixture, meaning R and S, because we're starting from something that was planar, right? In all of these cases, we have our nucleophile attacking the carbonyl carbon, which is flat, which means there's an equal probability that it attacks from a, on top or from underneath. So we're going to get the mixture of the R and the S, no matter which of these we start with. Let's practice a few more. I'll give you guys a few minutes. How would we use a Grignard reaction to make each of the compounds below? And there can be more than one possibility here. I'll give you guys a few minutes, then I'll work through them. So for this first one, we could have butanaldehyde and methyl magnesium bromide. We have the methyl group that would be acting as our nucleophile. Or we could have those split. We could have methanaldehyde, also known as formaldehyde, formaldehyde and a butyl magnesium bromide. That one's probably going to be less desirable um, because formaldehyde is not all that stable on its own. Um, when you when you use formaldehyde in in bio labs, it's you're actually using a, a formaldehyde solution, where the formaldehyde is not really present as free formaldehyde. 
and it's got lots of water around too. So that would be, not be a very good candidate for using the second option is less desirable. Generally speaking, when it comes to deciding which of these we want, it's going to come down to practical considerations. They're both valid ways of writing this based on how the, the reaction is or how the question's written. But the one on the left is a better option if we were actually going to do this in lab. Um, and this is one where you guys should be thankful. We're not actually having in-person labs because we'd be doing a Grignard reaction this quarter and Grignard reactions are notorious um, for failing because you basically have, you have to set up your entire glassware apparatus in an oven with it all completely sealed and dry it with one end of it open um, overnight at least to drive off all possible moisture. And then you seal it while it's still hot. And then with hot um, gloves on, you have to move your entire glassware apparatus with it still being sealed into a fume hood. And then you can try and do this. But the problem with that is um, if you let in just a little bit of ambient air because one of the joints wiggled when you were moving it, um, then you wind up with moisture in there and you wind up with that ruining your Grignard reagent and you wind up getting no product. Um, so it's very, very frustrating. They actually make entire fume hoods that actually are temperature controlled like an oven um, so that you don't have to move your glassware once you set it up um, because it's that much of a pain and will and just that little tiniest amount of water getting in will totally throw off your entire your entire reaction. Um, no, we were about it was the the reaction that was it was coming up um, right when COVID hit, because think about last year, this time was right when COVID started getting serious. They shut us down in March, but we started having things get canceled around the end of February. So they were just about to do this one. Um, and we didn't uh, and we didn't get to it. And I was actually OK with that because I'm not even sure we have large enough ovens for all of our glassware. We would be drying it all and then very quickly moving it and, set, and setting it up in the lab. Um, we probably would be okay with that based on the fact that um, our air is so dry here. If we were in San Diego or in you know, Houston or something like that, then uh, we, we would have trouble um, trying to, to set it up that way because they have so much moisture in the air. Uh, relative humidity being so low and it being winter means we could probably get away with it and get at least a little bit of yield. All right, looking at these other two. This is another one where we have two possibilities. Um, and part of that is because we have, it's a tertiary alcohol, but two of those R groups are the same. So we could actually start from the acid if we wanted to and use excess Grignard reagent. So we could start from methyl magne and then methyl magnesium bromide. We could also start from the, but the butyl carboxylic acid and just have two of these. We would, we would be then going through that substitution step twice, but we could add two methyl groups because we're talking about adding the same thing twice because we have two R groups that are identical, we could use this process as well. Um, or you could use formic acid. Again, one carbon compounds that are that oxidized are not that stable. So this would probably be the better option, but in theory, you could have, um, let's see, formic acid would look like, Actually, no, it would be formaldehyde. We'd have to do formaldehyde again, have to do it in two steps. So we wouldn't even want to do that.
And for C, we're making a primary alcohol. How could we do that with a Grignard reagent? Be really easy to do this. We use sodium sodium borohydride. Cody, do you have enough something? I was just going to ask if you could have a magnesium bromide with just a hydrogen attached to it. So, in that would be the the obvious way to call it a Grignard reagent, um, and satisfy this question. Um, realistically, what we would do is we would take the the aldehyde and use sodium borohydride would be a better option. But we could, in theory, have a propyl We could have formaldehyde and then propyl magnesium bromide. That would be the way to do this and still call it a Grignard reagent. But like I said, formaldehyde is not that stable on its own. Um, you almost never see pure formaldehyde because it almost always has some water in it. Um, so this one is one where we, this is the way we would do it. If, if I said you absolutely have to use a Grignard reagent, um, realistically, we would take, do this as, um, a sodium borohydride, start from the, the four carbon aldehyde and use sodium borohydride to add the hydride instead of adding a carbon. Adding hydrides is usually easier than adding carbons, um, if that's one of your options. Let's see. All right, we'll end there today. Um, Keep an eye out for the quiz. The quiz is going to be some practice with some oxidation states, probably, and um, a couple of these hydride reactions and Grignard reactions. Um, and I'll, I may have you draw a mechanism just so you can get some practice, since clearly you guys need that. And these are quick mechanisms to draw, right? They're not that tricky. So get yourself used to. My arrows go from electrons to the positive charge. Um, for me, these ones, these mechanisms make a lot of sense once you remember where the, the negative charges are. Hydrides have a negative charge, therefore they're a nucleophile. Boom, that, that's it right there. Um, and then you just have to do a proton transfer step. And the Grignard reagents are the exact same thing, except it's a carbon with a negative charge. And so, um, that quiz will go live once I have a time to finish writing it and you guys have time to take it. So it'll probably be up, um, going live around, around five today. Any questions before we end? All right. Well, have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, I do have office hours at 1030. If anybody has any questions you want to ask them.